All right, so a few more people will join in, but let's let's get started. So thank you very much uh, for uh, coming to today's session of the Cardiff Analysis Seminar. We were supposed to be in person, but the next best thing is to have it online. So we are delighted to have uh, virtually Andrea Mondino from Oxford today, who will be talking about op optimal transport and quantitative geometric inequalities. So thank you very much for accepting your invitation, for agreeing to deliver this talk online anyway. Um, and uh, over to you. Thank you very much. So thank you, Matteo, and uh, to all the organizers for the kind invitation. So I plan to, to come in person, but say, uh, unfortunately, yeah, uh, yeah, I was not uh, in uh, full shape since, since yesterday, so I get to uh, move to um, online. So thanks for uh, um, managing it. So all right. So today I would like to uh, talk about optimal transport and uh, uh, geometric inequalities in quantity form. So the um, the goal is to, is to discuss some uh, geometric um, inequalities in uh, smooth by manifolds with tools coming from optimal transport. And the rough idea is that uh, in the last 10, 15 years, um, there's been a surge of activity and of uh, literature of uh, optimal transport tools in order to study non-smooth spaces with lower bounds on the Ricci curvature. And a lot of techniques have been de have been uh, developed in this uh, in this uh, framework, and it and it turns out that some of these techniques uh, can be useful to uh, prove new results uh, even in the smooth setting. So uh, today I will uh, give a flavor of some um, results uh, in this uh, direction. So I will um, talk about two papers. One is joined with the Cavalletti and Maggi, and is a, and it is about a quantitative form of the Levigram of isoperimetric inequality. And the second paper is joined with Cavalletti and Semola and is about the quantitative form of Obata rigidity theorem. Let me start with a warm up about the isoperimetric problem, which is one of the oldest problems of mathematics, uh, having, the, uh, having its roots in myth of more than 2000 years ago, I think of the Queen Dido uh, problem. So we all know it, but let me just uh, say, uh, recall it uh, for sake of uh, to be uh, self contained. So um, given a space X that we can think of uh, a Riemannian manifold or a major space or whatever, so a space X and some volume V, the question is, uh, what is the minimal amount of boundary area which is needed to enclose uh, such a volume V, okay? So of course, uh, if the space X is the Euclidean space, uh, then we have the uh, super classical isoperimetric inequality, uh, Euclidean, as a inequality, which tells them that if we take any subset E, say with uh, either smooth boundary or with finite perimeter, then we can bound the, um, the perimeter of E with the, the boundary area of a round ball having the same volume of uh, the set E. If instead the, the space X is the uh, n-dimensional sphere, then we have an analogous uh, statement, which is the spherical isoperimetric inequality, which tells uh, that uh, if you take any subset E in the sphere with finite perimeter, then you can bound from below the perimeter of the set with uh, the boundary area of uh, a metric ball, which is spherical cup in the, in, the, in the sphere, having the same volume as the ball. Okay. Now, let me say that in both the examples, uh, the, the Euclidean inequality and the spherical isoperimetric inequalities, the space is fixed, it's either the Euclidean space or the spherical or the sphere. And what happens is that such a space contains a model subset, which is a metric ball, and then we compare any subset of the space with the model subset. Okay, now the next, now what I am interested in today is in, is in the Levigram of isoperimetric inequality which is probably the most famous uh, as a parametric inequality besides the Euclidean one. And it is more general because now we don't fix the space. We just consider any uh, smooth manifold with lower bound on uh, the Ricci curvature. And then, we're, and then we are going to compare the perimeter with, of the subset there with subsets in the model space, which is the sphere. Okay, so the statement is as follows. We consider an n-dimensional Riemannian manifold with the Ricci curvature bounded from below by n minus one. And then we consider a domain E with smooth boundary. 
Then we consider the n-dimensional round sphere of, the, of unit radius. Notice that uh, we take we choose the, the radius to be equal to one, so that the Ricci curvature of the n-dimensional sphere is equal to n minus one. So we are saturating the lower bound on the Ricci curvature. And then inside the round sphere, we consider a magic ball B having the same renormalized volume as the set E. Okay, so here, what do I mean? I mean that I consider the set E and the, the ratio between the volume of E and the volume of the manifold M. And I want it to be equal to the ratio between the volume of the magic ball B and of the ambient uh, sphere N, uh, SN. Then the Levy-Gromov isoper uh, Levy isoperimetric inequality is telling us that we can bound from below the renormalized perimeter of E with the renormalized perimeter of uh, the ball in the sphere. Okay, so here, what, what is the renormalized perimeter? Again, is the perimeter of E divided by the volume of the manifold M. And here on the right-hand side, we have the perimeter of, of uh, the ball divided by the total volume of the sphere. Okay, so here, um, let me stress it uh, again. So while in the Euclidean and, and in the spherical isoperimetric inequalities, the ambient space is fixed, is either the sphere or the uh, Euclidean space, in the figure of inequality, the space is not fixed. So what we do is uh, we is any subset in any manifold with rich bound below by n minus one is compared with the model subset, which is a spherical cup, Inside the model space, which is the sphere, so you have you you you, you have two models. Both the both the space is uh, the model, which is the sphere, and and the subset in, in the subset inside the space, which is a sphere. Okay, and moreover, another another difference is that the Levirum of inequality is global in the space, in the sense that uh, it, the left hand side here, the perimeter of E divided by the volume of M does not depend just on the subset E, but it depends also on the complement of E inside M. Indeed, if, we, if one changes the space locally outside of E, also the, the left-hand side may change because we may change the volume of M. Okay, so the Levigram of inequality is global in the space, and this is going to be, I'm going to come back on that in a couple of slides. Okay, it will be useful for what comes next uh, to rephrase the theorem of inequality in terms of the isoperimetric profile. So what is the isoperimetric, the isoperimetric uh, profile of, the, of a Riemannian manifold Mg is this function that I denote with I, Mg of V. So V plays the role of the, of the renormalized volume and is a real parameter from zero to one. And the isoperimetric uh, profile function is the infimum of the renormalized perimeter of all the subsets, all Borel sets with finite perimeter, having normalized volume equal to V. And with the and with the normalized, I mean always you divide by the ambient, by the volume of the ambient manifold. Okay. And this is because uh, the, the, these are the quantities that appear in the in the Levi-Gromov inequality. So with this uh, notation and a simpler way, maybe a, a more synthetic way to state the Levirum of inequality is that if uh, we have an n-dimensional manifold with the rich but below by n minus one, then the isoperimetric profile function of the manifold is bounded below by the isoperimetric profile function of the round sphere for any volume between zero and one. Okay, now uh, a beautiful statement attached to the, to the Levigram of inequality is the rigidity. So the rigidity uh, answer, to, answer to the following question. If equality is achieved in the Levigram of inequality, what can we say on the space and on the subset? Okay. So more precisely, if there exists a subset E in M with the renormalized volume equal to V, satisfying that its renormalized perimeter is equal to the uh, isoperimetric profile of the sphere at that uh, volume D. Then what can we say on the, on the space? Well, it, it, it turns out, it is quite strong, that the manifold must be isometric to, to the round sphere. Okay, so if uh, for some volume you achieve equality in the Levigram of inequality, then your ambient manifold must be a sphere. And this is why, uh, this is 
this is one way to see that the, the, the Levino inequality is global in the space. Because uh, notice that uh, this volume V could be epsilon, could be arbitrarily small, non zero, but arbitrarily small. And this means that your set E can be very, very small, so very, very tiny. And if you can find such a subset, very, very tiny, which achieves the equality in the Levirum of inequality, then globally, your all manifold must be isometric to the round sphere. And why is the case? So this, this can look a bit, uh, uh, say, surprising at, uh, at, um, say, at, the, at the first sight. And morally, the motivation is that uh, when you achieve equality in the Levirum of inequality, you are both minimizing the perimeter and you're both maximizing the volume of the ambient space. And, uh, and, uh, and the manifold with maximal volume um, among all, all manifold of reach one below by n minus one is, is the sphere. So this is morally uh, the motivation, okay? And uh, moreover, if you achieve uh, in the equality in the Levirum of inequality, then your subset E must be isometric to a metric ball inside the round sphere. Okay, so this is the reality which is uh, well uh, known and well established. And today I would like to discuss the question of the stability. So stability is the following question. If equality is almost attained in the Levirum of inequality, what can we say on the space and on the subset? So the, the, the first question is, what can we say on the ambient manifold M? Must the ambient manifold be close to a sphere? In which sense, in which topology? Second question is, what can we say on the subset E? Must the subset E be close to a metric ball? In which sense, in which topology? Right, so let's start from uh, the first question. So question one. So this was uh, uh, understood. Uh, this is a classical. Uh, this is a classical question which was uh, investigated uh, already in the past. And uh, there is a beautiful paper by Brabe Songallo in Inventiones in '85 where they proved this uh, uh, quantitative version of the Levirum of um, inequality, which said the following. So we have an n-dimensional manifold uh, with reach point below by n minus one and with the, the diameter equal to d. Notice that uh, recall that from Bonnemeyer's theorem, the diameter of a manifold with lower bound on the reach by n, n minus one is uh, at most pi. Okay, so the, the diameter of such a manifold is uh, always between zero and pi. Okay, then what they prove is that uh, the ratio of the isopermetic profile of m and the isometric profile of the sphere is bounded below by an explicit function, by an explicit formula, which is the ratio of two, of, of, of two integrals. So you are integrating the cosine function on the numerator from zero to pi over two, and on the denominator from zero to d over two, and then you take everything to power one over n. And this is true for every d between zero and one. Now, notice that since the cosine function between zero and pi over two is positive, then this right hand side is always non negative. And so this, this is, uh, this in particular implies the, the Levigram of inequality. But it is stronger because it, it, it is saying that if for some volume the ratio on the left hand side is close to one, then also the ratio on the right hand side must be close. Uh, 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 let me think. Okay, no. It is saying that so if, uh, that if for some volume you almost achieve uh, equality in the Levigram of inequality, then your diameter must be almost equal to pi. Okay? So it is saying that uh, if you have an, 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 an error delta in the, uh, in the Levigram of inequality, then the diameter of your manifold is close to pi in a quantitative way. So the diameter might be close to pi with an error delta to power one over n. It follows directly from this uh, uh, from this statement, okay? And then, and then one can apply a, a beautiful result by um, Chira and Kolding, which is called the almost maximal limiter theorem, which says that if you have a manifold with the rich bigger or equal than n minus one and the emitter close to pi, then your manifold must be close in chromo of topology to a spherical gas suspension. So uh, what is a spherical suspension? Um, one can, so geometrically is like a lemon or a rugby ball. So one can think of it as uh, 
um, so in the smooth setting, the only manifold, smooth manifold with Ricci big or equal to uh, n minus one and with diameter equal to pi is uh, the sphere. If instead you enlarge your class of spaces and you allow also spaces with singularity with the reach point below by n minus one in a suitable static sense, then you have a larger class of spaces with diameter equal, equal, uh, equal to pi. And these are spheres and Fermi suspension. So one should think of them as kind of uh, generalized spheres with uh, maximal diameter. Okay. And then let me also mention that uh, uh, this theorem one was uh, uh, say improved to a sharp version by Emmanuel Milman in a paper in uh, GEMS. Okay, so this basically, uh, this, gives, this gives an answer to the first question. So if we almost achieve equality in the degree of inequality, then our space must be close in both other sense, maybe not really to a sphere, but to something which resembles a sphere, which is a spherical suspension. Okay, now what about question two? So question two, is what can we say on the subset E? So must, be, must it be close to a round sphere, to a, to a, to a metric ball? So um, before, uh, say, passing to the Lidigram of inequality, let's first see what has been done in the literature about this kind of question in more classical settings of uh, Euclidean space or uh, spherical uh, isoparametric inequality. So in the, in, the, in, the, in the Euclidean space, this kind of question, uh, is uh, goes under the name of quantitative Euclidean as a parametric uh, inequality. There have been uh, several papers on that. Let me just mention the uh, the last ones with the, the sharp uh, uh, results. So um, this is a paper by Fuschumaj and Bratelli in, in Annals of Mathematics 2008, where they prove that there exists a constant depending only on the on the dimension of the Rn such that for every subset E inside Rn, there exists a round ball optimally centered with the same volume of the subset E and such that the volume of the symmetric difference between E and the ball divided by the volume of the set E is bounded by the constant, the dimensional constant times, this can be seen as the Isoparametric deficit. So is the ratio between the perimeter of E and the perimeter of the of the of of, of the of, of the ball minus one to power one over two. So since now by the Euclidean isoparametric inequality, we, we know that uh, this ratio, that, that, that this right hand side is always non-negative. And this is and this is quantifying how close in L1 sense, in volume sense, my set E must be. To a round ball, knowing that it is close, knowing that its perimeter is close to be optimal. Okay, so it it is saying that it is saying that if the perimeter of E is close to the, to, to be optimal in the Euclidean algebraic inequality, then the ball then I can find a ball such that the volume of, of the symmetric difference between the the set and this optimal center ball is very small and small quantified in terms of the isoparametric deficit. Okay, so of, of course, this implies the, the Euclidean isoparametric inequality, um, just because uh, this, right, uh, just, just because the, the left-hand side is, uh, is uh, non-negative. And um, the, the right-hand side plays the role of isoparametric deficit, so it is controlling how far is the set E from being optimal in the Euclidean isoparametric inequality. The proof of Fusco, Maggi, and Pratelli uh, is inspired by the proof of Euclidean as a parent inequality via the uh, Steiner, Steiner symmetrization. And what they basically do, they are quantifying the, they are quantifying the symmetrization there. There has been alternative proofs of this uh, beautiful uh, result. One uh, alternative proof uh, by Figali, Maggi, and Pratelli, uh, published in, in uh, Inventiones. Um, goes via the uh, L2 optimal transport map of uh, Brenier. So um, there is an alternative proof of the Euclidean isoparametric inequality using the uh, Brenier map of optimal transport, and they quantify that, that, uh, that proof. And then there's an, uh, another uh, still different uh, approach by Cicalese and Leonardi, which instead is based on periodic theory and the traction principle. 
And this approach is uh, uh, probably is the most, uh, say, flexible one, as it, as it has been uh, um, say very useful for proving uh, other generalization of the Euclidean geometric quality and also other quantitative forms of other uh, geometric inequalities. Okay, so this was the Euclidean isoparametric inequality. Now, what about the spherical isoparametric inequality? Is it possible to quantify it? The answer is, is yes, it was proved by Bogle and Duzza and Fusco, where they proved that uh, for every volume, for every dimension, one can find a constant depending on the volume and on the uh, dimension with the following property. We take any subset E of the sphere having renormalized volume equal to V, so the ratio between the volume of E and the volume of, of the ambient sphere is equal to V between zero and one. Then there exists a metric ball B inside the sphere having the same volume of E such that the symmetric difference of the ball and the set is bounded by this constant times the spherical isopermetic density. Okay, so again, here you can you should read this, uh, uh, this uh, statement as saying if I know that the perimeter of uh, the set is close to the perimeter of a spherical cap of its, of, of its volume, then we can find the spherical cap such that the volume of symmetric difference of E and, 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 and the spherical cap is small and is controlled in a, an explicit way by this right hand side. And the proof of, uh, of, of this regard of this of this result uh, goes along the same lines of uh, Cicales and uh, Leonardi selection principle. Okay, so this is the answer about question two in the uh, say more classical frameworks of Euclidean and spherical isopermetic inequalities. Now, what are the difficulties if one wants to try to do the, the, the same for the Levigram of uh, isoparametric inequality? Well, the the, the, say the biggest challenge is that uh, while uh, in the Euclidean and in the spherical isoparametric inequalities, the space is fixed and is the space with the highest possible degree of, of uh, symmetry. So it is a space form, it has constant sectional curvature, it has the, uh, it has the, say the, uh, the, uh, the elevator loop uh, is, that is as large as possible. Instead, the theorem of inequality is for any manifold with the lower bound on the Ricci by n minus one. So there's no fixed space, there's no symmetry, and the above approaches seem not to be applicable. Indeed, the, the symmetrization, which is the, the approach by Fusco, Maggi, and Pratelli, seems to have li little chance because uh, since, the, since, the, since the ambient space is, is not symmetric, it makes little sense to speak of uh, symmetrization in the space M. The approach via L2 uh, optimal transport, so via the, the, via the, the brain map, the approach uh, of Figalli, Maggi, uh, and uh, Patelli, works very well in Rn, but already in the sphere, so fixed space round sphere, it is an open problem, as far as I know, to prove the spherical isoparametric inequality via the brain map. And the one which is most flexible, the selection principle of Cicalese and uh, Leonardi, would need to work, it seems uh, that it, it would need some stronger convergence than the one that we have at uh, disposal. So uh, the class, the, the natural notion of uh, convergence for spaces with lower bound on the Ricci is a measure of outer convergence, which is weaker than C0 convergence of the matrix, while the uh, selection principle goes via the regularity and would need the smooth convergence of the ambient matrix. So these three approaches seems not to uh, give, uh, seem notably uh, applicable for the Levigram of inequality. And so we give a different uh, approach and we work uh, via L1 optimal transport and via localization. And at the end of the talk, I, I will give you a flavor of this technique that has been quite useful for proving uh, several uh, geometric inequalities in sharp and quantitative form. Okay, so just a little, say a brief history of localization, just to give you a little taste of, uh, of it. So this, uh, localization, this localization technique is a way to reduce an a priori complicated high dimensional problem, so in higher infinite dimension or in, or in n dimensions, to a family 
of simpler one-dimensional problems. So how you do that? So it was classically um, introduced in RN or in SN using the high degree of symmetry of uh, the space. And how you arrive to a one-dimensional uh, object is via iterative uh, bisection. So the, uh, the roots is a paper of Panem by Berger in the 60s about sharp estimate on the first again value of the Neumann uh, Laplacian in a compact convex set of Rn. And what they do, they, they start from a compact convex set in Rn. They take a, a, um, a function with the null mean value. Uh, since, it, since it has null uh, mean value, one can find an, uh, a, 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 a hyperspace, which uh, uh, divide the, the convex set into two parts where the uh, function still has null mean value in both of the two half spaces. And then you iterate it again. So for, for each of the all two half com convex body, you again cut in, uh, in half, then again in half, in half, in half, in half, in half, in half. After uh, countably many um, cutting in half, you reduce the, the dimension by one. Then you iterate, 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 until you arrive to a one dimensional space. Uh, this one, if you if you keep track of the uh, vol of the volume measures, you write that 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 uh, on this one dimensional space you have uh, a measure which satisfies some uh, good uh, um, uh, convexity properties, and then ex exploiting this, uh, you can prove the inequality in uh, one dimension and, and then go back to the uh, to the uh, higher dimensional problem. So this was. Um, say, started in by, by Pane and by Berger in the 60s. Then, then it was formalized by Gromov and Vitaly Milman in 87 and by Kanalovat and Simonovic in 95. But this was still in spaces with a high degree of symmetry, either Hilbert spaces or RN or SN. And uh, there was a, a breakthrough by Clark in 2014, where it was able to extend this kind of paradigm to remaining manifolds, so without any symmetry assumption, via L1 optimal transport. So no symmetry, uh, but uh, the proof by Clartac still heavily uh, relies on the smoothness of the space because he needs to do, uh, say, estimates on the second form, form of level sets, uh, is doing basically computation in the, in the, in, in the spirit of einstein culture if you uh, know this literature. And then um, uh, such, such a technique was, it was, it was extended uh, to no smooth spaces with lower bound on the uh, Ricci using only optimal transport tools by Cavalletti and myself. And today I want to give you a brief, uh, say, flavor of, uh, uh, of this technique and its applications. Okay, so this was uh, the, the, some snapshots of the technique. Um, I will come later to, the, to more details. And now let me just take the Results. So what we prove uh, is the quantitative version of the levi of inequality, which has this uh, form. So take uh, any volume between zero and one in any dimension bigger than n, bigger than two, then there exists a constant depending on the dimension and on the volume with the following properties. Consider a Riemannian manifold, M of dimension n, with the reach going below by n minus one. Then for every, subset E in M with renormalized volume equal to V, there exists a metric ball B inside the manifold with volume equal to the one of, the, of, uh, of E, such that the symmetric difference of uh, E and the ball is bounded by, on the right-hand side, I have the constant, I have the dimensional constant, and the levi of isopermetic deficit. So here inside the uh, parentheses, I have the ratio, I have the normalized perimeter of, uh, of, uh, of E minus the isoperimetric profile of the sphere to a power. So again, here how to in interpret this is uh, you have your manifold with our bound uh, Ricci. You know the levi of, um, in, uh, levi of um, inequality, which is telling you that the, that the normalized perimeter of uh, E is always uh, bigger or equal than the one of the of the of the of the of the sphere. So the right hand side is always non-negative. But if you know that uh, uh, the perimeter of E is almost optimal, so if this right hand side is is close to zero, 
then you can say that you can find a metric ball inside your manifold such that the volume of, of E symmetric difference with the, the ball is very small and controlled explicitly by this uh, the bigger mob uh, uh, deficit. So in particular, if you know that your set E is isoperimetric, so it, it achieves uh, the isoperimetric profile function of the manifold, then you can say that uh, you can bound the symmetric difference of E and a shootable ball with the uh, difference between the two isoperimetric profile functions of the manifold and of the sphere at the right volume to the, to the right power. Okay. Now let me stress the difference between this statement of the quantitative Euclidean and quantitative uh, spherical isoperimetric inequalities. So here uh, in this statement, the set E is a, is a subset of the manifold M. And so the left hand side is all living in M. So you have, a, you, have a, you have a subset in M and a metric ball in M. While the right-hand side is making speak two things which are in different spaces. So the perimeter of E divided by the volume of M is something which lives in M, while, while uh, I of Sn is the isoperimetric profile function of the sphere. So a difficulty in proving this uh, statement is that you need to make uh, the manifold M speak with the round sphere, and then and then um, uh, use this uh, relation to prove something on the subset uh, uh, E of M. And the idea to, to do that is to use optimal transport to make the, the, these two spaces speak to each other. Okay, so um, I made so I uh, made the statement for smooth manifold because it, it is already new and interesting there. But actually, we prove. Both theorem one, which is the one of, of uh, Berard Song and Law about the uh, almost maximal di diameter of uh, a manifold having uh, the degree of uh, inequality almost uh, achieved, and this theorem two uh, that I just mentioned about uh, closeness to the metric ball, we, we prove them in a much higher generality of uh, possibly non smooth spaces with the lower bounds on the rich curvature. So more precisely in the setting of essentially non-branching CD and minus one and metrometer spaces. So what, what are these guys? So these are metric spaces endowed with a reference volume measure, so which makes them metric measure spaces. And they satisfy lower bound on the Ricci by N minus one and upper bound on the, on, on the dimension by N in aesthetic sense via optimal transport in the sense of lot sturm -Bilen. So yeah, I don't have time to enter into the technicalities, but the idea there is to uh, is that, uh, say, you have this lower bound on the rich in upper bound on, uh, on, on the dimension by analyzing convexity properties of uh, shootable entropy functionals in the space of, uh, um, in the vast space of uh, probability measures. Okay, so you have uh, uh, probability measures, you metrize them with the vast time topology, and you have, um, you have uh, geodesics in the vast time space, and then uh, analyzing the convexity of uh, the entropy, you can uh, make sense of this lower bound on the rich. But uh, this is out of the, uh, I could give a, a full talk just on that, so I would keep it short. But I will just would like to, to mention some class of examples entering into uh, this class of spaces instead of going to, into the details of the definitions. So weighted manifolds with n dimensional Bakri Emery Ricci tensor bounded below by n minus one are example of, of CD n minus one n spaces. These are Riemannian manifolds where you multiply the um, the volume measure by a, by a smooth weight, and then you can build up a modified Ricci tensor, which is called the Bakri Emery uh, Ricci tensor. Then another class of uh, spaces are limits of manifold with lower bound on uh, Ricci. So, measure of first of limits of Riemannian manifold with, lower, with Ricci but below by n minus one. Are example of uh, this class of spaces, and more generally, if you have heard about them, the class of RCD, M1 and N spaces. 
So all of these, so the first two guys are example of, 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 of space with lower bound on the Ricci. Then there is a uh, beautiful theory of uh, no smooth spaces with lower bound on the sectional curvature. These are metric spaces, um, which, which uh, satisfy lower bound on the sectional curvature in terms of uh, triangle comparison, uh, a la Topogonov, and they are called Alexander spaces. And Alexander spaces uh, with the curvature bound below by one, and which have a uh, five dimension, are example, enter into, in, enter into, into, into this framework as well, as well as things are manifold, satisfying CD and minus one n. Okay, so um, you are you. So in this framework of CD and minus one n, n spaces, you can allow both singularities and metrics which are not Riemannian but but things there. So it is really a quite large uh, class of spaces. Okay, and. Uh, um, both theorem one and theorem two, meaning the uh, almost maximum diameter and uh, the uh, closeness to the metric ball, uh, are proved in such a generality. Okay. So now I would like to um, go to part two, which is uh, so the part one was about the Levigram of hydrodynamic equality and the quantity form. Then in part two, I would like to uh, briefly uh, mention the quantitative form of Obata theorem. Okay, so what is the Okoba uh, So let me start by a beautiful result by Lichnerowitz, which is a, a um, sharp Poincare inequality on manifold with lower bound on the rich. So if you have an n dimensional manifold with rich bound below by n minus one, then you have this uh, sharp Poincare inequality, which, 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 uh, which tells that for any function, say Lipschitz function for simplicity, but the Sobolev is good enough with the null mean value, and you can bound from above the L2 norm of uh, the function with one over n, the uh, Dirichlet energy. And the constant one over n is sharp because it is attained on the round sphere. This can be phrased uh, in, uh, just in, in other terms, in terms of uh, the spectral gap on the first non-zero eigenvalue of the, norm, of the normal Laplacian. Indeed, the, the first non-zero value of the normal Laplacian is the infimum of the, of the Dirichlet energy among functions uh, with L2 norm equal to one and with null mean value. And so this, uh, one, this sharp Poincaré inequality can be phrased by saying that for any smooth manifold of dimension n and which bind below by n minus one, then the, then the first eigenvalue is bounded below by n, which is the, the first eigenvalue of the sphere. So the sphere is achieving the minimal uh, first eigenvalue among all the uh, smooth manifold with lower bound on the Ricci by x one. Okay, so this is the inequality. And then you can uh, imagine what I'm going to ask next. What about the rigidity and what about the stability? So the rigidity is the beautiful theorem of Obata in 62, where he proved that if you achieve equality in the Lichnerowitz spectral gap, then if and only if the manifold is isometric to the sphere. And moreover, let me know that uh, when the manifold is uh, the sphere, they know exactly who are the optimizers, who are the, uh, say, who are the, uh, the uh, first uh, eigenfunctions, which are, they, have, they are cosine of distance functions. So you, you, you take any point of, on uh, the sphere, you, you, then you take the cosine of distance function from that point, Normalize it to have L2 norm equal to one, so multiply by square root of n plus one, and then you have a uh, first again function with uh, L2 norm equal to one and the Dirichlet energy equal to one. Okay, now what about uh, stability? So if equality in the spectral gap is almost attained, what can we say? So Chen and Croke proved that uh, the first again value is close to n if and only if the diameter is close to pi. But their result is in terms of epsilon delta and was not uh, quantified. Then, uh, Brabber Song Alon, in the same paper that I mentioned before, they proved a quantitative statement in the diameter by saying that uh, if I know that the first second value is close to be optimal, close to n, then the diameter is close to be maximal. The diameter is close to pi in a quantitative, in a, in a quantitative sense. And then Bertrand, uh, more recently in 2007, studied what can we say on the eigenfunctions. 
So he studied a stability result for eigenfunction. So he, he, he proved that there exists a function, um, tau t, which goes to zero, t goes to zero, such that if the first again uh, value is close to n, so is uh, n plus epsilon, so this epsilon has to be thought as the error, then one can bound the n-infinity norm then one can find a, a suitable pole x, a, a suitable point x in the in the sphere, such that the uh, the fun, such that the function f is close to, to the cosine of the distance function in an infinity norm with this tau epsilon. Okay. Now the question is, and and and, and this works for f to be first eigenfunction. Now, the question that I want to ask is, uh, can we make uh, Bertrand result uh, quantitative? So can we really estimate this tau epsilon really in a, um, can we estimate it in terms of epsilon in a quantitative way? Is it epsilon to some power? And can we generalize it uh, to functions which are not again functions, and we just know that they are almost optimal in the Rayleigh quotient, and can we, Extend it to non smooth spaces as, the, as I mentioned before to this non smooth space with lower bound on uh, the Ricci. So, more precisely, the question is if I have a function which is Lipschitz with L2 norm equal to one and with no mean value, and I know that uh, it has a Raleigh quotient uh, close to n, which is the optimal one, is it true that my function is close to the cosine of the distance function from some point in M in some suitable norm? Notice that here the one well, difficulties is that uh, if we know that the function is, a, is an eigen function, then it satisfies the PD and ATPD, and one can uh, run maximum principle, chain of random estimates, and all the machinery of PDs. If we don't know that the function is, a, is an eigen function, we just, have an, we just have a kind of a small energy, we don't have a PD, and we need uh, to work with energy estimates instead of uh, PD estimates which makes things uh, more tricky, okay? But nevertheless, uh, it, this is possible, and this is a result uh, uh, proved in, in collaboration with Cavalletti and Semola. And, uh, okay, so the statement is as follows. So for every n, which is the dimension, there exists a constant depending only on the dimension with the following properties. Let m, g, be an n-dimensional manifold with the reachable and below by n minus one. Then for every Lipschitz function f with null mean value and with L2 norm equal to one, we can find a pole, a point x in M, such that the L2 norm of the difference between f and the cosine of the, of the distance function from the, po from the point x normalized to, to a, a L2 norm equal to one is bounded by such a dimensional constant times the difference between the dish energy of f and n to a suitable power. In particular, if we know that f is a, is a, is a first eigenfunction, then we can bound the L2 norm between f and the cosine of this function should be normalized with constant times the, 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 the difference of the first eigen uh, value of the manifold and uh, the first again value on the sphere to the suitable power. So, and how to interpret this uh, result is that uh, if I know that my function has a small Rayleigh uh, quotient, say f is norm one, so a small dish energy, then it must be close to the cosine of this function from one point. And uh, close in which sense? In L2 norm sense and quantitative uh, with this power, okay? And um, so here I gave the statement for smooth manifold, but uh, uh, we prove this more generally for non smooth spaces with lower bound on uh, the Ricci. Okay. okay. So this finishes the, the, the part of the statements. And now in the last, uh, say, five, 10 minutes, I would like to give you some ideas of the proof and of the techniques that are uh, used for establishing this uh, result. So the, um, say, the cornerstone uh, for both of the um, results is uh, the so-called one-dimensional localization. So the one-dimensional localization uh, is roughly the following. So you start from an n-dimensional space or even an infinite dimensional space. Um, 
and you want to prove some inequality. And for proving this, this inequality, you either have a function or you have a, and either you have a function and you want to bound something of this function, uh, kind of the L2 norm of the gradient, like the depth, or you have a set and you want to bound from below the perimeter of the set, or something like that. And then uh, the localization, uh, the, the idea of the, of the localization is to perform a partition of your space into one dimensional objects, typically geodesics. This partition is optimally driven by your function or by your set. The idea is that uh, on each element of this partition, or, or, on, on each uh, geodesic, you have uh, a measure on it, which makes this one dimensional object, the geodesic with the, the volume measure on, on it, having in uh, have the same lower bound on the Ricci as your ambient space in a, in a synthetic sense. And then you want to exploit this, uh, uh, this uh, simplification of, 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 of having the partition of in one dimensional objects to prove the inequality on the one dimensional objects and then go back to your uh, big inequality in the big space. Okay, so this is the rough idea. Now let me be more precise on what is uh, specifically a one-dimensional uh, localization. So the setting, the general setting for, uh, for it to work is the one of uh, uh, metameter spaces with lower bound on uh, the Ricci. So if you're not familiar with that, think of a smooth manifold. So X is the, is the manifold or the metric space. D is either the, the metric of the metric space or the Riemannian distance. And M is either the volume measure of the metamedial space or the uh, volume measure of your, of, your, of, of your manifold normalized so that it has total volume equal to one. Okay, so this is the setting. Then you consider a subset E inside X, which is the one that you have in mind to prove a lower bound on the perimeter. And what the localization is doing is it is providing and an essential partition of the space X. So this uh, family uh, X alpha is, uh, is a family of, 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 of subsets of your space X indexed by a, uh, index alpha in the uh, index set uh, Q, uh, which is not countable. Q is just a letter. It, 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 it has nothing to do with the rational numbers. And this uh, X alpha is a partition of X up to set of, of measure zero, meaning that the measure, meaning that this X alpha are all disjoint and they cover X up to, up to a, a set of measure zero. Then once you have this, uh, this partition uh, of X up to a set of measure zero, then you also have a partition of the, of the ambient measure. And this is a, uh, known in the literature as a disintegration a theorem. And if you're not familiar with that, you can think of it as a kind of non-straight uh, to be theorem, which is telling you that you can write the, the volume measure M as follow. So you have a probability measure on, on, the, on the set of indices. And for each element of, of the partition, you have a measure M alpha, which is again a probability measure. And then you can write the ambient measure M is integral of these one dimensional measures M alpha over the, over the set of indices, okay? So you have a partition of the space and to, to that you have a partition of the measure into measures which are supported in the uh, element of the partition X alpha. Now, which element of the partition X alpha is a, is a geodesic in the space X. And when you consider X alpha, endowed with the, the one dimensional distance as a geodesic and with the, this measure M alpha, well, this is a, a CDK space, meaning that as a weighted space, it has the same curvature dimension conditions as the ambient space, okay? So topologically, it is one dimensional, it is a geodesic. But uh, if you look at it with the weighted measure, then it has uh, Ricci bounded below by K, and dimension by the above by n. And then the, the, the fourth key, key property is that the, um, the, the, the volume of set E is equal 
to the volume of the intersection of E with each element of, of the partition, X alpha, with respect to the measure M alpha. Okay, so you are this in, so you are so you are finding a partition of the space X. Uh, as you do that, you have a partition, you have a partition of the measure M. Uh, each element X alpha is a geodesic with the with the, uh, with the, the associated measure is a CDK in space, and they all have the same volume equal to P. So how, how you do that via aeronautical transport? So the idea is to uh, consider two measures. The first one is the um, characteristic measure of the set M, of the set E. So is the characteristic function of E. Uh, divided by the volume of the set E multiplied by M. So it is the characteristic measure of the E. And the final measure mu one is the characteristic measure of the complement. So you are doing optimal transport between E and its, and, and its complement with respect to which cost is the, the, the cost is the distance function. And the idea is that uh, um, this X alpha, so this uh, geodesics, are the integral curves of minus the Cantorovich potential of this optimal transport problem. Okay. Okay, so this is more details, but we don't have time for that. So maybe I will just have time. We, I don't have time for, for the quantitative version, but let me just give you the flavor. So how to prove the levi of inequality with the, the um, uh, with this one-dimensional localization and briefly discuss uh, how to quantify that. But okay, so. We saw this one-dimensional localization. Now I want to uh, give you an idea how to prove the n uh, algebraic inequality with that. Okay, so algebraic inequality means that we want to find a lower bound on the um, perimeter or the outer mean content of a set. So a way to measure the boundary uh, volume of a set is the outer mean content, which is this right hand side, which is you take the volume. If you take this, the set E, you take the epsilon enlargement of E, you take its volume, you subtract the volume of E, meaning that you, at, at now you have uh, the volume of the epsilon to run neighborhood of E, you divide by epsilon and you let epsilon go to zero. This is one possible way of measuring the, um, the, 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 bound, the area boundary, the area of, 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 of the boundary of E. Okay, which is known as outer mucosic content. Okay, now we, we, when we want to do a isopenetric inequality, we want to find a lower bound on this guy. Okay, now we know uh, that we can uh, partition the, the measure M using the, the inversion theorem, meaning that we can write the measure M as integral over the set of indices Q of this one dimensional measures M alpha. So if we if we do that for both this guy and this guy, we have this integral here. Okay, and we want to find a lower bound on this integral. Okay, now by fa two, we see that we can put the limit inside. We uh, go down, but we are still at it because we want a lower bound. And now we observe that each measure m alpha is concentrated on the geodesic x, x alpha. So I don't lose and I don't win anything by just intersecting with X alpha, which is a geodesic. Okay. Now I observe that uh, this right hand side is the, this this second guy is the, the same. And for the first guy, I observe that uh, if I first enlarge by epsilon and then I intersect with the X alpha, this set always contains the set which is that is obtained by first intersecting with X alpha, taking the epsilon enlargement, and then intersecting back with X alpha. So this set here is just a simple size of set theory, is contained in this set there. And so it has smaller volume, and we are still happy because we want a lower bound on the volume. Okay, but now this looks very promising because the integrand here is exactly like this guy, so is exactly the, the outer minkowski content, but of which set is the outer minkowski content of E intersected with X alpha, okay? And now X alpha is a, is a geodesic with a weighted measure. So we reduced, so from here to here, we reduced the proof of a, 
a supermetric in a, of a lower bound on the perimeter of a, of a, of a set in a high dimensional space with the finding lower bound on the perimeter of subsets of intervals with a weighted measure, which is much more simple. And indeed, just by the smooth uh, Levy-Romov inequality in one dimension, and by the fact that uh, all these sets inserted with X alpha have the volume equal to M alpha, and by the fact that each measure is a CD N minus one N measure, we can say that uh, this out of the content of, of uh, E inserted with, with X alpha is bounded from below with the, the uh, hypermetric profile of the, of the sphere evaluated at the volume of this set, which is a length now, which is a weighted measure over a set. Okay, but now we recall that the intersection of E with each element of the partition is always the same, was property four in the, in the previous properties, which is always equal to the volume of E. So each one of these M alpha is equal to the measure of E, which is very good because now the integrand is not anymore depending on alpha. Q is a probability measure, and so this is equal to the uh, to the um, as a parametric uh, profile function of uh, the sphere at uh, the volume of E. And so this proves the uh, the Euclidean. This 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 is, it is a proof of the of the Levirum of of the Levirum of inequality, which holds also in normal spaces with lower bound on the ridge. Now, if we want to quantify this, uh, this now the idea for proving the quantitative the, the degree of inequality is to quantify this uh, proof. Okay, so you um, assume that uh, uh, the, the right hand side is is you assume that this left hand side is close to the right hand side. You go back to the various steps and you want to infer something. So. Okay, so maybe it's a bit. Mm, okay, I can just maybe give two words about that because if, if we do the, all the all, 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 I, all details, I will go over time. So the basic idea is that if the if the um, left hand side is close to the to the right hand side, then everything in between must be uh, all the errors must be delta small also in the also in the uh, in the intermediate steps. Which means, if you look at here, it it uh, it means that uh, by by uh, Chebyshev for a, a large set of indices alpha, your uh, m your e with with x alpha must be equal, must be uh, almost uh, optimal in the one dimensional space. Now this means, uh, if you look, if you study the one dimensional object, that uh, the intersection of e with 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 x alpha must be close to a small interval um, in, inside. Uh, the segment x alpha. Moreover, you also get uh, that the length of x alpha must be close to pi. This is by studying this, followed by uh, studying the measure m alpha. So you have that uh, each ray must be close to pi in uh, length, which is the which is the maximum diameter, and you have that each subset it must be close to a segment inside this uh, this array. And then you have to prove that uh, now. The, the, the two uh, key bits are to prove that uh, all the segments have a common close, uh, have a almost common north pole and uh, south pole, and that uh, you and that uh, your and that uh, the segments inside the rays are all uh, either in the south pole or in the north pole, and they are not half in the south pole and half in the and half in the north pole basically. And the idea is that uh, if they are half in the north pole, half in the south pole. Then you are creating an, an, an interface which creates a, a perimeter and this uh, destroys the, the, the almost optimality. So this was very, very fast. So sorry for being fast. I hope that at least uh, the um, the of the inequality was clear, and then I will be happy to uh, answer questions uh, if there are any. Thank you very much for your attention and sorry for going over time. Thank you very much. So are there questions for Andrea, either from our live audience or online audience? Perhaps I'll start with one. Uh, so in your, in your um, theorem, uh, the 2019 
Sipan theorem uh, mm -hmm. one. Um, if you can go back to that one, so yeah. So uh, I was trying to understand the dependence on dimension here. So is there a way to understand this exponent, perhaps? Yeah. So it's so the way to understand it is is a big O of one over n. So if you look um, at uh, so maybe already here. So already, yeah. So already here in the Braber song alone, right? You have the, the ratio between the um, the isoparametric profile function of the of the manifold and of the sphere is bounded by this guy to power one over n. And basically, so the um, it is saying that uh, so is this statement here. So the the diameter of your manifold is uh, almost maximal, so close to pi with an error, which is delta to the power one over n, and this delta is the error that, that, that you are making in the, um, in the isoparametric uh, deficit, basically. Um, right. So in order to prove the, uh, the, this statement here, we do, it in, we do it in two steps. In the first step, we prove again that we have an almost maximal uh, um, diameter, which is of the of, of rate one over n, and not only you have almost maximal diameter, so almost almost maximal diameter would mean that you that one can find at least one length geodesic with length close to um, uh, pi minus delta to power one over n. Uh, here, what we can prove is that you that you, that you can find many many geodesics with almost maximal length. And these geodesics are the ones which are performing this um, localization that was mentioned before. And um, okay, so this one over n comes from that. Uh, from, from that. And, um, and this exponent, uh, how we interpret it is, is a big O of one over n. I expect that one over n could be the sharp one uh, in the, um, uh, in, due, to the, due to the, say, no smoothness of, of the space is quite hard to make predictions on uh, on the sharp exponents uh, and to I mean uh, the, say the the range of possible uh, combinators is quite large so I guess that the sharp exponent could be one over n and this is asymptotically sharp in the sense. I see. So the, 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 this particular formula is just an artifact of the technique. Of the, the proof. That's right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. oh, the proof, yeah. Uh -huh. And, it, and uh, okay, again, on this formula, it, did you have an estimate on how the constant depends on dimension or is it known how? Yeah, so the constant is, uh, um, right, so the, the constant is, uh, let me go back to the, to the is uh, very much related to this one. So this constant uh, is, uh, is very much related to this one, where instead of D, you put uh, the, um, you know, I don't remember e exactly the specific form, but uh, it has to do with this right-hand side. So it is computable uh, and uh, one has to play with this right-hand side. I see, thank you. But one can compute it, yeah. All right, thanks. All right. Sorry, and this uh, yeah, sure. one over N estimate, here, so one over N, power in this estimate, is it optimal? This is optimal, yeah. This is optimal, and uh, this is optimal in the, yeah. Uh, so it, it is optimal in, this, in, the, in the setting of CD and minus one, so in the synthetic setting of essentially branching CD and minus one and, and, uh, and uh, spaces, and it is super easy. So it, you, you just consider um, the segment zero pi, you put on it the, um, length distance, so the, the, the one-dimensional distance on the segment, and uh, uh, the uh, volume form is, uh, say the, the measure is sine of uh, sine to power n minus one t in, in the t. This makes it uh, the space as uh, t minus one n uh, space. If you just chop the segment by, uh, by delta, then you check that uh, uh, it achieves, uh, then this achieved. It uh, achieves uh, 
equality in uh, here. So this is one dimensional. So this uh, achieves re this is really sharp in the, uh, in the synthetic setting. If instead you want to study what happens in the smooth setting, well, it is a bit more complicated, but you can still do it because basically this segment with uh, the weighted measure, you can see it uh, as a, a collapsed limit of uh, uh, n-dimensional manifold. So you can, uh, the idea is that you, you take the segment you do a warp product with an SN minus one, you put uh, the right uh, warping function and uh, with that, uh, it will have reached when below by n minus one, it will be uh, smooth, but very, very, uh, say, collapsed to the, it is almost collapsed to the one dimensional segment and uh, it will um, uh, achieve the inequality, the equality here up to an error, which is going to zero. So the answer is yes, it is, uh, it is uh, sharp. It is really attained in the, in the synthetic setting and, and it is asymptotically attained in the smooth setting. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. More questions for Andrea? Right there from a live or online audience. So, okay, Julian has one. Yeah, um, so when you talked about the isoparametric profile, um, then you had some comment where you said that when you have a, an isoparametric a set, right, then, then you can make this estimate um, of the, in terms of the, of the deviation of the isoparametric profiles. Yeah. So is it always known whether there actually is, uh, is an isoparametric set in this generality? Yeah, so this is, yeah, um, one can, uh, so in this, uh, in this generality, one has uh, a good notion of, of a perimeter. Uh, the perimeter, in, this is um, quite well known. Uh, say, uh, let me mention the papers by Ambrosio in the 90s, uh, and then also others uh, work on the, on, the, on the topic. The perimeter is uh, lower semi-continuous, also in the setting of metric major spaces, and then you can run the Say oh. the classical, say the direct method in the, in, in the calculus of, uh, of the variation. We take a minimal sequence, uh, it is compact in uh, L1, perimeter was my continuous, and, and, sense, and then you have a minimizer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. thank you. But, but say, but the big difference, so there is a, so this part of the existence of a, of a, of a, of a minimizer is kind of uh, um, say, the same as in the smooth setting. What uh, is the really big difference uh, when you are in a metric measure setting is that uh, in the smooth, when your ambient space is smooth, then you know that the minimizer, then you can run the highly non-trivial regulated theory. Then you can say by say, Angren, et cetera, that uh, your minimizer is going to be smooth up to, up to a set of co-dimension seven, uh, eight. Um, and then uh, basically you can treat it as it were basically as it were smooth. And this is how the classical proof of the Levirum of inequality works. When you are instead in the um, mathematical setting, there's no hope to prove uh, that the set is smooth because your ambient space is, is, uh, is uh, not smooth. So basically the best hope is, is that, is that uh, the isoparametric set uh, to be as regular as the ambient space. But if your ambient space is, is uh, highly singular, there's no hope that your uh, minimizer is, uh, is uh, regular. And then you cannot run the uh, proof of, say, the, 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 the classical proof of, uh, of, of Chromo via regularity theory. And this is why this A1 localization is useful. Thank you. Thank you. So if there are no more questions. Marcel, can I ask a question? Of course, go ahead. So, hi, Andrea. Um, hi. Do you know if what you're doing can be applied uh, in the Sabrimanian setting to Sabrimanian manifold? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so, something like that has been done. Right. So, um, yeah. So, the, 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 the difference. Uh, so, one cannot apply exactly this statement, but, but, the, but, the, but, the, the, but the, the technique, yes. In the sense that uh, uh, what I told you about today is about the, the CD condition, uh, mm -hmm. and it is known that the CD condition is not satisfied in uh, Sabrimanian manifolds. Uh, for instance, it's not satisfied in the Eisenberg group. But uh, the, the Eisenberg group and several uh, Sabrimanian structures 
satisfy a weaker notion of uh, uh, rich culture lower bound via optimal transport in the synthetic sense, which is the measure contraction property. So um, MCP, it is known as MCP, which is measure contraction property, which is basically saying that uh, the uh, bishop Bromov inequality holds in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an empowered uh, uh, sense. And um, one can um, do, uh, say, this uh, localization uh, technique works also for MCP. So you, you can do exactly this uh, slide when you um, change CD with MCP. And then you can prove an isoperimetric inequality with spaces satisfying MCP. This was done by Cavalletti and uh, a PhD student of, of him. I don't remember the, 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 the name of the other author. Anyway, it's a paper in uh, JFA. And um, in, the, in the setting of MCP spaces, uh, you have a slightly uh, worse, uh, say, lower bound on the perimeter uh, because they are larger. Uh, but the good thing is that they um, take this, this class uh, entails also sub Riemannian structures. Yeah. But all, uh, is the technique you're using the geodesics, uh, which yeah. collapse instantaneously there. So when we were, for example, uh, with Davide Vittone and Juan Manfredi, we were proving weak Fubini properties. We had to use uh, not geodesics, sort of uh, almost geodesic where you forced them to do not collapse because you have this problem except in the Eisenberg group where the geodesic collapse immediately. Yeah. You can do the foliation. You cannot do any foliation by geodesics. Is what you do. You replace the geodesic with this sort of uh, segment in the kernel structure that avoid collapsing, or you do in a different way. I don't know. Right. So, you know in fact, yeah. So, here, the say what, what uh, helps us is that we do not really need uh, to have uh, a complete partition. We are, uh, say, we are uh, allowed to throw away set of measure zero. So the cat locus in the Eisenberg group, it, it has a measure zero. So if you start, uh, so you can throw, so you, you, you can throw away the cat locus. And so you still have, uh, it is, so you, 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 you still have a partition. It, it, it is not really a smooth foliation because uh, it is not smooth, but you still have a partition by- uh, You don't even need to collapse because they collapse everywhere. They collapse the geodesics. They are not local and unique. So you yeah, have this collapse in geodesic. I understand you can throw away zero measure set. I cannot see this give you just a zero measure set. Yeah, but then, and then the point is that we are also selecting the uh, the geodesics. So we are we are we are we, we, we are we are not taking all the all the, the geodesics from one point. So basically, you have two sets which are far away. You have, you have, yeah. you have two sets I know which are because they do with Fubini is the same, but mm -hmm. exactly with Fubini you cannot do using geodesics. You okay. have to use different uh, construction because while the geodesic always collapse, you can do sort of quasi geodesic that you force to do not collapse. And this okay. construction works, but with the geodesic, we tried for years with uh, Vittone and Manfredi, and the, uh, to us, it didn't work because they collapse. There is nothing you can never okay. we collect have, we any have to way you don't collapse. So here it works quite well, but also because, say, the, the, the advantage of, of this approach uh, is that. Uh, so you forget about uh, the specific structure. You just work uh, in the in the metric setting. Uh, yeah. The L one uh, transport gives you a partition in uh, in uh, geodesics. This this is given up to a set of measure zero, and then you can apply as a black box the the disintegration the, the theorem, which gives you this uh, kind of Fubini uh, type formula. So it is a uh, Say, probably uh, you have in mind a much more precise uh, Fubini, theo Fubini type theorem uh, where uh, maybe you, you, you want some structure also on uh, say, both on the, on the geodesics and on the set which is parametrizing the geodesics. For us, uh, say, the, the set which is parametrizing the geodesics is no structure at all. So it is just... Uh, a set of indices with the measure. I don't understand of that. So you don't need any sort of local uniqueness for geodesic. You no. don't care of structure where geodesic collapse all the time and foliation uh, shrink no. to one point. No. Okay, I'll look. I'll look but maybe it. it's because you are looking for a much more precise uh, theorem. So our uh, say, this, say this is say this uh, 
what we need here is very, very little. So it is just, it, it, it is only to be able to write, to write down the no, measure. I, understand. I just don't see at the moment how you get this partition in a, in a Heisenberg group, for example, but maybe I just need to see. Okay, so maybe I can tell you. So this is, okay, I, I, I skipped this slide, but since you asked, so it's, it, it's a good Thank moment to, to answer. So, so what you do is, uh, say, say that you are in a, in a box in your Heisenberg group with finite mm -hmm. measures, so that uh, we are in a set of finite measures, say that it has volume one. Mm -hmm. Then you want to um, take the, then the, the way to construct this, uh, this uh, partition is you have a set E inside X, inside your, your uh, box, with the volume between zero and uh, one, so it's uh, also the complement uh, as non-zero measure. Yeah, yeah. Then, as the, then you consider as first measure, the characteristic measure of your set, and as final measure, the characteristic, the characteristic measure of uh, the complement. Okay, and then you settle the L1 open transfer problem from mu zero to mu one, meaning you take the infimum among all the probability measures in the couple x times x, with push forward on the first marginal equal to mu zero, push forward on the second marginal equal to mu one. And you take the inf over all these couplings gamma of the distance function. Okay, this is the L1 optimal transport problem. And it is known by say, classical optimal transport techniques that you can find the minimizer gamma, which is a probability measure in x times x, and a Cantor's potential. So a Cantor's potential is a one Lipschitz function phi from x with value into r. And this phi is related to this gamma. In this way, um, it is it is rated in uh, this way that uh, the, that that, uh, this, that this measure gamma is concentrated on the couple of points um, x and y in x times x, which uh, which saturate the one Lipschitz condition. So phi of x minus phi of y is equal to the distance. So these are these are called rays because uh, um, the set of of points with this property are are uh, are Geodesics, um, which are uh, foliating your uh, your uh, your set gamma. Okay, so you the minimizer, and this and this uh, and this minimizer uh, uh, gamma is concentrated on this uh, set of couple, on, on, on these couples. Yeah. Now, the key thing is that uh, you can use this uh, relation uh, capital gamma to define a, an equivalence um, relation over uh, x by saying that two points are uh, related if and only if either the couple xy is in this capital gamma or switched yx is in gamma. Now, you can check this is an equivalence relation. It is not hard. It is just by transient quality and by the fact that phi is a one inch function up to a set of uh, measure zero. And the equivalence classes are uh, geodesics. And this is uh, how you have this partition into, into geodesics. I see. So it's a very general. Uh, so this yeah, uh, this okay. this works in in, in any metric space, uh, and uh, once you have a Borel measure over the metric space, uh, you can use this partition to do the disintegration theorem. And uh, yeah, so it works uh, for any metric space, uh, which is maybe need locally compact or something like that, but very very little. Thank you. Thank you for the question. All right. So. I think it's time to thank Andrea again for the very nice talk and for the extensive answers to our questions. So. Sorry. <laughs> thank you very much. So good. So. He asked almost a second talk as questions. <laughs>